Good afternoon, and um, this is um, a really a wonderful opportunity to have you, uh, Professor Rutter, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, on the occasion of the fifth award that we are giving this year uh, in honoring Leon Eisenberg, Professor Leon Eisenberg at Harvard. And uh, I am here with also with Carola Eisenberg. And uh, we would like, uh, on behalf of the, also the Academy of Child Psychiatry, to ask some questions uh, about uh, your experiences, perspectives in choosing child psychiatry and your career. Um, so this is an incredible um, uh, opportunity for us to have you here and ask you in person some of these questions that I have personally been dying to ask you. Um, I like to also say that this is sponsored uh, in part by the uh, History and Archives Committee of the American Academy of Child Psychiatry and chaired by Dr. David Klein, who's here with us today. Um, and thank you for coming, and uh, we'll, we'll start the interview. Thank you. So um, I'd like to begin, actually, uh, from the very beginning, which is um, you, where you were born. And uh, I know that in your case, especially, that has been covered before in previous interviews. But I wanted to make sure we get this on the video record uh, for for us in terms of not only your birth and but also your childhood, as well as your career choice subsequently after medical school and getting into child psychiatry. But uh, I wanted to ask you some of these personal questions, if, uh, if you don't mind, uh, and giving us some uh, answers about uh, your uh, birth and where you grew up. That's fine. Yeah. Happy to talk yeah. about that. Well, I was born in Bramana, which is in the hills above Beirut. In those days, that was Palestine. It is now, of course, Lebanon. And I was there until... Um, 1936, uh, when the family returned to the UK, my father had a uh, period uh, running the medical service in Bramana uh, for the American Friends Service Committee, and we came back. So that was a brief period when I spoke Arabic as well as English. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, that has long since gone. I speak none at all. Um, it was interesting, however, from a social sense, in that throughout the journey on the boat, uh, I taught Arabic to all the sailors. Because although nobody had ever told me anything, uh, I had picked up the people who worked with their hands spoke Arabic mm -hmm. and professionals spoke English. So at the end of the journey, when my mother was picking me up from where I was talking with the sailors, they were astonished to find that I spoke English. Mm -hmm. So uh, then, uh, your father is a physician also and was a general practitioner, correct? He was a general practitioner, but also then worked in the, the public health service uh, mm -hmm. in his later period. Mm -hmm. And this was part of the Friends uh, uh, and Quakers? Um, in Romana it yeah. was, in England no, it was part of the, right. what ultimately became the NHS. Of course the NHS didn't exist when we first came back. So, and, and in terms of your education in England, um, tell us a little bit about your early education and then subsequently your grammar school and, and, and also your schooling in York. Right, yeah. okay. Right. Well, I came back um, just before the 11 plus. Um, and schooling in America, of course, is entirely out of sync with that in England. So I had learned nothing about any of the things that came up in the 11 plus, uh, And I failed the 11 plus. Uh, but in those days, the headmaster had the right to choose 10% of the intake on his judgment uh, and not just on the 11 plus exam. And so he chose me, uh, aware that I just made a major transition, I guess, and that that had to be taken into account. So I came in at the bottom of the fifth stream uh, into the grammar school and uh, 
by the end of the first term, I'd moved near the top of the first stream. That was the most amazing mo morale-boosting experience. And uh, so that was good. My time at the grammar school was a happy one, but they did not do biology in those days. And I already was thinking possibly of a career in medicine, although I hadn't come to a decision. And therefore, I would have to do biology. And so I moved to a... Quaker boarding school in York, Bootham, um, and remained there until I left school at 16 to go to medical school. Now, we kind of skipped the, uh, a very important period where, and I will get back to that, um, when during the beginning of the war, your parents decided for safety, you and yes. your sister, to send you to United States. And uh, so you spent some time Four years there. Four years. In and um, it was a very good four years, I have to say. Yeah. Um, the family I went to did not know my parents, but they had friends in common, so that there were kind of links. And people always expect that that was a stressful period for me because I was separated from my parents. All I can say is that I never felt separated from my parents. My American parents, because that's what I viewed them as, did an absolutely spectacular job in keeping my parents very much part of our conversation over the meal table and in the evenings. And so I simply had two families um, for those four years, not separations from one of them. I mean, of course, there was physical separation, but there wasn't psychological separation. And um, the American family was very much my family. It took a while when I came back for them to realize that um, they were still important to me. They had felt out of a sense of duty that they had done their job and now had to return me to my parents and that I should have no connection with them. But that, of course, wasn't the psychological reality. And I, in fact, kept in touch with my American parents uh, throughout the where time. Where did you live? In, where, where, where was this in America? In uh, Moorestown, which is a small town near Philadelphia in New Jersey. Okay. And um, so um, my American parents, um, well, my father, foster father, I suppose, um, died earlier, although he was still pretty old. But my mother uh, did not die till a couple of years ago at the age of 102. Ooh. So she was wonderful, long lived. <laughs> so did you know that you were actually living very close to Leon Eisenberg during this time? <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that at the time. Well, because he grew up, he grew up in uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so this is pretty close. Oh, yes. yes. Um, Most time, not quite a suburb of Philadelphia, but it's in commuting distance. Yes. So, so that was the uh, period that we had skipped. So you go yes. back, you pass the, what we now call the common entrance examination, what you yeah. call the 11 plus, get yes. into a grammar school. Yes. And when you were um, uh, in the grammar school, so you go directly from the grammar school to the uh, medical school? No, I went to the grammar school to the to boarding, boarding, boarding school, school in York. And then from That's there right. to... So medical that was school. about... Uh, Five years in the boarding school or four years in the boarding school? No, uh, I think three years. Three years. Because I had skipped yeah. several years, mm -hmm. hence leaving school at 16 to go to medical school. Right. I was actually just past my 17th birthday when I went to medical yeah. school. Of course, these were common I issues in terms of children being sent yeah. away during the war in England um, and also children going to boarding school. So yeah. for most American audiences that might seem kind of unusual, but yeah. in, in, it wasn't the, in England that wasn't no. unusual at all. <coughs> so then um, you enter University of Birmingham Medical yes. School, and uh, so that's a great medical school. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience uh, when you enroll as a medical student and your dreams, expectations. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the plan was to join my father in general practice. Right. Uh, initially, but during the time at medical school as an undergraduate, I uh, became interested in brain and mind. Uh, I did 
um, later house jobs in psychiatry, neurology and neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also during that time that I did a, an elective with Professor Meyer Gross, who was a uh, professor at Heidelberg, but then left through the persecution uh, to come to England. I have to say he was not as well treated as he should have been in England. He um, was respected, but he wasn't given a really important position. But what was really important to me is he ran a unit at one of the mental hospitals in Birmingham, and that's where I met him. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Um, he was an amazing teacher, uh, very bright, very engaged in all sorts of things. What he did was give you a patient from one of the back wards and you had one hour to interview the patient and then you present it to him. And so I did that. I could make neither head nor tail of what the patient said. It was total rubbish as far as I could see. And so I thought I'd better just confess. So I said, you know, Professor Margaret, I'm sorry I've failed you completely. It's a total waste of time. Uh, I've learned nothing. And he said, well, let's see. Take me through the interview. Describe what you saw, what you observed, uh, what he said. And so he showed me that I'd made all the necessary observations to make a diagnosis of what in those days was called hebephrenic, schizophrenic, schizophrenia, somebody with thought disorder and so on. And transformed a humiliating failure into a pseudo-success. It was a pseudo-success, of course, because I hadn't recognized the significance. But that was wonderful teaching. And um, that enthused me uh, into psychiatry. Um, and I subsequently uh, got his guidance on um, what to do in training and one of the things he advised was to spend time training in uh, general medicine neurology uh, before going into psychiatry and that's indeed what I did do um, and later on then he advised me to go to the Maudsley I was wary of that because I knew I would have to do research there and I thought I knew that A, I would hate research and B, I'd be no good at it. As it turned out, I loved it and I turned out to be reasonably competent at it. Uh, so he, he was an important mentor. Yeah, and, and the world has been a better place. <laughs> so the, um, I know that uh, Mayor Gross uh, had also written uh, or, or edited one of the major textbooks yeah. of psychiatry with um, Martin Roth and Elliot Slater, Slater right? Correct. And so he had connections at the Maudsley. Yes, indeed. Roth and Slater were at the Maudsley. Yes, yes, right? they were. And so, and he was also interested in phenomenology. Yes. So, and and uh, what was his influence like? I mean, he was interested in these case studies and interviews and so on, but also this idea of phenomenology was very different than some of the interests yes, at, well, at the time in the United States. Well, he was a polymath. I mean. Yeah. He knew everything about everything. I mean, that that's, sounds exaggerated, but uh, I challenge you to find things he didn't know about. <laughs> um, and he too was a wonderful teacher, and he was a generous teacher, so that um, if you proved him wrong in something, which happened very rarely, he would take pleasure in your success rather than concern that you had out done him and something or other. Um, and this was his style. Um, and he had, he built up psychiatry at the Maudsley. I mean, he, he single-handedly created it. And the social psychiatry unit, where I returned to after my period in the States, we'll come back to that, I presume, um, and almost everybody uh, was appointed at a pre-doctoral level. So at a time when you'd achieved nothing. And Jack Tizard, who was also an important mentor and later a close personal friend of mine, once asked him, how did he do that? And Aubrey thought for a moment and said, well, they had to be bright, 
but I took the awkward ones that others wouldn't have. Now, Jack wasn't very pleased with that as an answer, but then Aubrey went on to explain that he wanted people who would challenge the given wisdom of the moment, knew how to do it constructively, and how to test it all out. And that's what we did. But it is true that um, the unit mostly went on to become research leaders in right. the world, people like George Brown, Jack Tizard. Yeah. Now, uh, Sir Aubrey Lewis, yes. also like yourself, was knighted, <laughs> um, and was the first um, professor of psychiatry in the United Kingdom, as you are the yes. first professor yes. of child psychiatry in the yes. United Kingdom. He was originally from Australia. He was and, indeed. And uh, he was Jewish and yes. had come to spend some time, I believe, in Germany and also in the United States before he came to the Institute yes. of Psychiatry. Um, and lo and behold, uh, he was at Johns Hopkins. Yes. So tell us, um, do you know uh, that he was very much influenced by Adolf Meyer? Yes. And, and, and can you elaborate on what you think about that? And Because I have some questions on that issue. Okay. No, he was. And he liked the kind of, uh, I was going to say holistic approach, that's not quite the right word, but um, bringing together different aspects. So was it biological, was it social, was it psychological? Well, it was all of those things, mm -hmm. and that was very much the way he thought. Mm -hmm. um, he was also an anthropologist by training. Yes, and, he's um, done some studies before he came. Yes. To, yeah. um, and... Certainly he loved the contact with Hopkins and uh, th thereafter um, a joint exchange training program was set up between the Maudsley and Hopkins and so people would come across for a period usually of six months or so uh, in both directions and I, I'm not sure that that still exists but it certainly went on for a very long time and was great success from both sides. That must have been one of the first global health in exchange programs in the yeah, world. I think it was. Um, so the connection here is basically, and I want to come back to that because of Leon and we are right. on the occasion of Leon Eisenberg's sure. um, celebration today. But um, he was very much influenced, of course, by Leo Kanner. Yes. And then his Leo Kanner's teachers was Adolf Meyer. Yes. And this this and I have argued also that this is really sort of developmental psychobiology, the sort yes. of a that when this stream of um, influence uh, in American psychiatry that didn't take take sides in either camp, uh, but had a very social conscious as yes. well, um, stayed on uh, and influenced a lot of academic uh, development of academic psychiatry. Um, evidence-based psychiatry, subsequently modest psychiatry. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to sort of put that on the record, actually, because um, I know that uh, when you came to the Maudsley, uh, Aubrey, Ma uh, Aub Aubrey Lewis was really very much established yes. as, a, as an influence there and stayed on to be a very important influence on yes. many people. Um, so. Then you uh, set up the unit, uh, the MRC, Child Psychiatry Unit, and... Um, that was much later. Though, much later. That was, yes. that was in the So 80s, I went back it? to join the Social Psychiatry Unit, mm -hmm. uh, where um, I remained until I got my chair. Um, the uh, situation when I returned was an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me go back a stage, actually. You were saying you wanted to touch at some point why I chose child psychiatry. The answer of which is I did not choose child psychiatry. Aubrey chose it for me. Uh, now, he was right. He knew better than I did what I would be good at and what I wanted to do. Uh, and certainly that influenced me uh, in the sense of recognising that doing something because you had to do it was actually quite a good experience to have, so long as you took it in a positive way. Um, and 
the um, when I came back, I was paid as a trainee, but functioned as a consultant. Now, you couldn't do that today, of course, it wouldn't be allowed. But it was a very interesting experience. You learnt on the job, and Aubrey knew that I most had good people around me to take advice from, and that I had the sort of personality which meant that I would do that. And so it, it, that actually worked very well. So, but he, he told you that you, you, you would be very good with children, right? So he sort of <laughs> sensed that so, something about you. So you would consider him as your mentor? Yes. Yes. He made two conditions. Right. But he said he wanted me to become an academic child psychiatrist. And I said, well, I hadn't thought of doing that, but I'll give it a go. And he said there are two conditions. The first was that I had to go... Uh, abroad to learn about child development. That I welcomed. I thought that, that a, a period abroad would be a good learning experience and I certainly needed to learn about child development uh, in order to be a child psychiatrist, so that I did. And uh, the second was that I should never be trained in child psychiatry and I never have been. And the reason was he said that the training was poor, which it was at that time, but also that the style of the training inhibited original thought, and he wanted training which would lead to questioning uh, and testing uh, and not simply learning, as it were, what was thought at that time. And so I never have been trained in child psychiatry. Now, of course, I have in the sense that I made sure that I'd received the necessary experience uh, in order to become a uh, child psychiatrist. Um, but also, um, I had to learn in becoming a scientist all sorts of other things. Genetics, which I not trained in, epidemiology, which I received no formal training in. And um, that, of course, is true even more today because times change. I liked it because I was aware through my grandfather, who was also a medic, uh, initially in general practice, but then moved into public health. So I lived with him for a year during medical school because uh, he lived in Birmingham, my family didn't. And so while I was dealing with anatomy and physiology and all the rest of it, he was off in his latest refresher course, then in his early 80s, um, learning new things. Now, he trained in the previous century, um, and more or less everything he practiced, he'd had to learn since he qualified. Uh, genetics didn't exist as a subject, biochemistry didn't exist as a subject, and so... Science was moving slowly in those days, mm -hmm. so now it's moving much faster. We're all going to have to do that. So did the Maudsley have any structured training, or you just have to self-teach yourself in you No, know, no, genetics we, we had a series of yeah. seminars. So it was a very unique place yes. still, as it is today. Yes. Um, so that was a very privileged training. Oh, it was. Yeah. Challenging. Challenging. But wonderful. So why do you think... Aubrey Lewis took an interest in you. He saw, was there a relatively small group or was it because he felt a kind of affinity towards you that you have towards him? I mean, that's kind of a mentoring, I, I, mentee I, question. I don't know. Yeah. We got on well together. Yeah. Uh, I had no social contact with him so yeah. that it's not that he knew me socially, um, but uh, he liked the fact that I asked penetrating questions yeah. and he responded to them. And he liked the fact that when he grilled me, uh, I responded in a positive sort of way. Um, so, yes, he, he, he was wonderful. He gave me opportunities. He gave me the freedom to do things. I always had the freedom to go against his advice. And I did so at my peril, uh, <laughs> but there were a few occasions when I did, and that was okay. So now I wanted to put in this segment where you come back to the 
you come back to New York right. to uh, spend some time in New York in training. And yes. uh, tell us about that experience and uh, how that went. That Was it a year? Or it was a year, was and it was a wonderful year. Right. Um, Which year was that, actually? That was 61, 62. 61, 62. Uh, and the, he had suggested various people for me to work with, uh, none of which appealed to me very much. Um, so Skinner was one of those. I did actually spend a day with Skinner during my year, but that was enough. So this was at, uh, in, in Belmont, or was it was in, uh, Skinner was in... Uh, he was in... Um, he was Cambridge. Yeah, Cambridge. Yeah, Cambridge. I think he lived in Belmont, actually. But that, that might be later on in his. That's yeah, yeah. that's a neighboring town to Cambridge for those who don't right. know. Right. Okay. Um, and then one day, um, Herb Birch came to give a lecture, and so after that lecture, I said to Aubrey, "That's the man I want to work with." Mm -hmm. I mean, he was he was another polymath actually, yeah. uh, and assertive. Uh, pugnacious, um, but wonderfully receptive. And uh, so he was working then, well, he did all sorts of things, but amongst other things, worked uh, with Alex and Stella on the New York Longitudinal Study. And uh, so I spent time at Einstein uh, with him uh, while being down at um, Bellevue uh, with Alex and, well, Stella. I was in a different university at that time. Um, and Birch, um, it's hard to explain what was so special about him, but he was not only uh, had a brilliant, incisive mind, but he rem would pay attention to the most insignificant of people. Uh, and I saw that in two ways. One is that uh, I later on would do site visits with him, and he was very receptive, asked critical questions, but the questions were in terms of what they wanted to do, not what he wanted to do. But I, at a more personal level, when he visited our house, which he did um, every year, I guess, uh, he would talk with my kids who were then young and he would remember the names of their pets from <laughs> last time, ask Wonderful. how they were getting on. They'd never met an adult like that. Yes. And uh, so... This is Herbert Birch. Herbert, yeah. this is Herbert Birch, yeah. At Einstein. And he, like Aubrey Lewis, um, like Maya Gross, like Leon Eisenberg was an iconoclast. Um, that he stood out for what he thought was important and would not be afraid to hold back, but was always courteous, as was Leon. So they recommended that you go and see some of the um, influential child psychiatrists or psychiatrists well, interested in child children and development. Is that why you went to see? That's why I went to see Leon, yes. Uh, but actually, most of the people they recommended I saw uh, were not child psychiatrists. So I, that's when I met Lee Robbins, uh, um, when I met Jerry Kagan, um, and Incredible. Uh, Ed Ziegler, uh, a variety of people. And the three of them, that's Alex Staller and her between them, knew more or less anybody who was anybody. <laughs> and they were tremendous. So they were recommend making these recommendations yes. for you? And they would make introductions. Or you were choosing them, them yourself? No, I didn't. So you have this god sitting on your right shoulder, <laughs> whispering, I'll tell you, you should do this and yeah. do that. You were very lucky. Yes. Honest. Well, I did. It was an exciting year. Yeah. And I learned a lot from all of them. Um, and Leon was the one child psychiatrist. Well, they introduced me to others, but Leon stood out head and shoulders above any of the others, I have to say. Um, head and shoulders above them in several different respects. I mean, one is he um, had a breadth of knowledge 
uh, which was quite incredible. Um, he, of course, was also very much an original researcher, scientist, and he also had a strong foothold in both biology um, and in public health, and that remained throughout his career. Uh, it mattered to him how patients were dealt with. It mattered to him what the implications were for community services. Uh, on the other hand, he was also concerned with the fact that humans had a biology and you had to take account of that. And for him, it was never polarized. I mean, it was never which it was. It had to be both. Well, this, I think, um, is the period also that Carola was uh, in Johns Hopkins during 61, 62. And at that time, you were married to Ma Manfred Goodmarker, uh, another well-known forensic psychiatrist. And so you were, um, you knew Leon because Leon was one of the faculty and he was the head of the um, uh, child psychiatry yes. unit that Leon, Leon, Leo Connor had, Connor had uh, started under Adolf Mayer's guidance. So this is a very interesting period because I've heard Carola talk about this period at, uh, in the United States, how it felt, because you came from Argentina. And uh, so um, do you, Carol, do you want to say anything, Carola? Because the, uh, I am delighted this, to hear yeah. what Michael is saying and remember that period with much detail. I cannot add much more. Yeah. I have a couple of stories that uh, relate mm. to that, but they are of no importance for this. Right. And um, I'll tell them to you afterwards, okay. but I remember that period. But there is this, um, what I gather is this intellectual integrity. Yes. And there is this sense of coherence and, and valuing uh, social community at the same time. Yes. Regaining biology and yes. feeling there is something there that needs to be worked and looked at. And but so this, this aspect of this integration, which is this psychobiological influence that we're talking about that came, had had its roots. Also of care for other people. Yes. So that he, he spent a lot of time with me. Uh, I was an unknown at that mm -hmm. time. And, uh, well, but not quite so. Well, <laughs> um, he was interested, and we had a lot of good talks at that time, particularly uh, in relation to the uh, scientific issues that we shared. So he, at that time, was concerned with the follow-up studies with Leo Kana, uh, and he was also concerned very much uh, with randomised controlled trials. And so we talked about that both times, which other child psychiatrists had that in that era really A knew not much about and B certainly didn't talk about them in that sort of way. And the style of questioning um, come, came through loud and clear. It was not destructive questioning, um, that's, that was never Leon's style actually, but um, it, it was Leo Kana's style. And um, I guess it was in the early 60s, after I'd returned to England, I had to give a vote of thanks for a special lecture that Leo uh, had given at the Maudsley. And I wasn't sure quite how to deal with that, but I thought, I'll say what I think and hope it's okay. And so I talked about his irreverence and I wasn't sure whether that would go down well or not. He was delighted. <laughs> Nobody had ever called him irreverent before, but it's certainly what he liked to be called. And I could have said exactly the same about Leon. I mean, he was irreverent, not in a hostile, aggressive sense, not at all, but he would not just take the given wisdom because it was a higher political figure in the psychiatric arena who, who had that view. He would want to talk about it. With you, but occasionally he was hostile toward the people that didn't uh, 
believe what he was telling, then he will get somewhat hostile too, because he was very sincere and wanted very much to for, for, for people to agree or disagree, but to believe that what he was telling was what he felt and thought. Mm. Well, no? yes. I'm not sure I agree. I mean, you, of course, knew him in a way that I didn't. But um, he had a certainly strong criticisms of psychoanalysis. Yes. But uh, he had many personal friends who were psychoanalysts. Oh, yes. And indeed, he married one. <laughs> 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 um, so that it was never personalized in that yes, way. That's true. And. Um, Interestingly, he, unlike me, um, never was concerned with whether psychoanalysis was true or false. As far as I know, he never wrote any papers with a critique of any particular aspect of psychoanalytic mm. theory, whereas I have written a few. So why was he negative? He was negative uh, for two different reasons because this is something I discussed with him. Uh, one is that the question of the truth or otherwise had to be settled by theory, and that meant what the gurus in the psychoanalytic world said was true, rather than what evidence of any kind said. And secondly, he was concerned that the cost of psychoanalytic training meant that it was very difficult for people to go into either academia or community services, neither of which paid as well as private practice. And it was that, rather than whether psychoanalysis was right or wrong, which was his concern. And it was sort of typical of the way he thought about these things. I wonder whether I can add one more factor that I think Leon might have implied in, in his discussions with me was the idea that he was very committed to training. Yes. And he saw that um, when in fact in, I think in 1967, he stands up and at the American Psychiatric Association and wants to transform, as he did at the Harvard Medical School subsequently, yes. the medical education, but the education of psychiatrists. Yes. And they say, well, there's really no room in the curriculum. And then he proposes to say, well, what about taking out some of the supervision time on other types of things? And that makes him, that's a very sort of a, a very shocking statement to hear. But then he actually told me that when he left the room, people came to him and they said, you know, Leon, we agree with you because we, we yes. really need to do this with something about educating um, psychiatrists. This was actually not just child psychiatry. We were talking about training of all psychiatrists. So I thought the, the training issue, and I know yes. that he was one of the first training programs. He was very committed to training young people. And um, so I just wanted to add the third one, which I think yes. no, might I, be I factor. agree with that. Yeah. And he's, I think that was the time... Uh, when, you're right, people at the end came up and said, yes, we agreed. But they all queued up to go to the microphone. The idea of yeah. dropping some of psychoanalysis from the training in order to fit in some biology... Was shocking. Shocking. Yes. <laughs> but the other thing, which I think is important, he had wit and style. Um, and he had it in high degree. And that enabled him to win over people who might otherwise be offended. That yes. I mean, a, a, people respected his integrity. I mean, everybody, whether they were enemies of his on a theoretical ground or not, they respected the fact that he was straight uh, and that he cared. Indeed. So um, let's go back to uh, the UK right. and uh, Jack Tizard yes. and I have to ask this the Isle of Wight yeah. studies these are very important threshold change in psychiatric epidemiology and tell us a little bit about how that study became formulated and your um, role in it right well it started by the Department of Education approaching Jack uh, to say that 
the time Cyril Burt did his surveys, at the turn of the century, the last century we're talking about, of course, um, the uh, physical problems uh, were strongly related to educational difficulties. Is that still the case? Can you find out? And so Jack said, yes, certainly we can do that. Uh, an epidemiological study can come up with that sort of answer. But surely this is an opportunity to do something more. Let us set up a study that is epidemiological, answers that question, but looks at the patterning more broadly of different sorts of difficulties children may have, and let, we, let us also do it in a way which will cast light on the causal influences that are involved. And he brought me in shortly after that, and we both had discussions. Um, the Department of Education uh, not only supported us, um, but um, uh, seconded Kingsley Whitmore, who was then senior uh, <coughs> officer in the department, uh, part-time to work on the study. And so this joint planning with government, which of course stopped short in 1979 and has never come back, would not happen today. Because it was doing a study that was informative, that would be helpful in the health and services for children in the long term. It was not answering a political question of the day. And I think that's the way it should be, uh, but it's never come back again. But the, yes. So this is after you come back from the United yes. States in the uh, mid-60s. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And he... Um, was extremely generous in um, giving me the opportunity to take up leadership on the study. And that was typical of Jack, very generous. He, of course, was an important mentor throughout, provided guidance and direction and thought, but he left it up to me to provide the leadership. It was a wonderful study. Um, it was doing things that now seems obvious, but at the time weren't, so that we interviewed children. Asking children about their symptomatology hadn't been done before, uh, and yet it's, it's a, why not? Uh, obvious, and it proved very productive. It was very much a cooperative enterprise. Um, we landed up in the Isle of Wight by accident, I should say. Uh, we were going to do a pilot study there, but the local services were so helpful and cooperative that we just both realized a population of 100,000 is just right for common problems and it's surrounded by sea so that you know when it begins and you know where it ends and so we did it there and never regretted it. Mm -hmm. So you kept very busy uh, during this period yeah. um, because then you start publishing a number of very influential papers yes. uh, including a paper on classification, yes. uh, the idea of triaxial classification yes. that came out, um, one might argue, might have influenced the DSM-3. Yes. Some people would definitely say that, like me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you really keep a very active um, academic um, productive uh, existence, but at the same time I wanted to compare as to your relationship or parallel relationship with the American Academy because we're sort of addressing the American Academy audience so that did you attend any of the American Academy annual meetings or, in, in, or was that something that on your radar at all? Um, were you uh, uh, coming to any of the meetings or was it didn't have the same kind of visibility at that time because... Uh, no, it didn't. Yeah. Um, I did go to American Academy meetings, but not till a little bit later, I think. Till the 80s? or My 70s, 70s. probably. Um, uh, and there was very little internationalism in the Academy at that time. Well, I'm not sure the Academy as such existed at that time, did it? Well, the Academy actually was founded in 1953, so okay. it has... No, it had, uh, did exist. And, okay. and therefore it has existed 
And there is a monograph of the history of the Academy that shows its evolution over okay. the years. Because I should it, read it. Yes. Uh, it hasn't been put up on the website, but it will be. Um, okay. Yes, please. But there was very little internationalism, as I thought about it, in the U.S. at that time. There were individuals who were very international. I mean, Leon certainly was. Uh, Lee Robbins certainly was. Um, and, and it would be true of others. But um, they were neither interested in nor indeed had heard about much research in the U.K. That has changed uh, so when dramatic. was the first time you came to, to visit the Academy and perhaps participate in one of the programs? Uh, I don't honestly remember, but yeah. it would be in the 70s. 70s, yeah. So pe people were beginning to notice some of the, uh, the work that you yes. were doing. Yes. And, um, so, so after the Isle of Wight, Yes. And there have been a number of other studies. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about the progression of some of those, because they have been very influential in child psychiatry. And I think our audience, child psychiatrists, or anyone interested in child mental health, ought to know that. Okay. Well, they're diverse. And yeah. if you look at any stage of my career, I always did engage in things which seemed incompatible with one another, but they weren't in my mind. Let me mention just a few. Um, one of the things uh, was the study of maternal deprivation and yes. the uh, book in 1972 um, uh, re reflected that. And that was where I first became strongly aware of the value of uh, animal models. So... Um, I had met Robert Hind, um, I've forgotten where now, uh, but I didn't really know him very well. Uh, but um, he had a reputation for being helpful as a critic of things, and so I thought, well, gather my courage, I'll write him, ask him on an early draft, would he comment on it? And my memory, which may have exaggerated over time, was that I got a memo back of 17 pages of detailed criticism. Uh, positive in tone, constructive, but guiding me what to do. It was wonderful. Once I got over the shock, I realised it was extremely flattering that he'd taken the trouble with a young unknown uh, to do that. So he was a professor at Cambridge University, yes. right? Yes. And he had also uh, worked or collaborated with John Bowlby. Yes, uh, he yeah. had. And um, John Bowlby um, was quite unusual among psychoanalysts, because he, he was a psychoanalyst, um, in bringing together a very diverse group of people when he was doing his work on attachment. So there were... Um, experimentalists, there were um, evolutionary people, uh, biological people, and that seemed the obvious thing to do in his mind, and so it was. It meant that when his books on attachment came out, he got an extremely hostile press from within psychoanalysis. Subsequently, psychoanalysis have um, sought to hold him as one of their own, but he had a rough time of it from them. Um, whereas the world as a whole, quite rightly, gave high praise for the book. They're, they're wonderful books. Um, Bowlby's followers saw me uh, as attacking Bowlby. Bowlby never did. Um, we disagreed on one or two things, um, but by the end of his life, we were much more close together than we were apart. And um, so that, for example, he was influenced by his own study of children admitted to hospital in recognising that separation was not the key stressor, which is what he had first thought it was. Um, and so that was one of the things I was doing. And, of course, it led to a whole series of family studies of various kinds subsequently. Um, 
So the, the, there were these movies that James and yeah. Joyce Robertson, Robertson had made, and they were very influential also. Oh, very. Right. Yeah. More, more so in the world of practitioners right. than Bowlby's theoretical writings, mm -hmm. because they just sort of gripped one, and they were marvelous films. Yes. Um, Every child psychiatrist should watch them. They're yes. like black and white movies. Yes. And of this they, they're still worth seeing. One other thing was that we um, were doing a study comparing children uh, in their families in London and on the Isle of Wight. And as was my want, uh, we had a feedback session uh, to the people who worked with us, uh, including school teachers, and uh, talking about the findings. Now, one of the findings was the schools varied in rates of problem behavior and in academic attainments. It wasn't what we were studying. It was a sort of throwaway line on the way. But I have mentioned this as part of the feedback. And there was this lady sitting about six rows back who gave me a terribly hard time. And I thought, you know, why is she being so hostile? At the end of the talk, she came up to me and uh, said, you cannot leave the findings there. We as teachers have to know, are the children so varied because of what we have done with them or because of the variations in the intake? What I propose is that we set up a joint working party of researchers and teachers and uh, plan such a study and I will guarantee to take it through the necessary um, groups. Well, a bit of a shock to find out that she wasn't being hostile, she just wanted to know, was this solid? Was it, was it worth taking further? She was as good as her word, and um, so that got me into educational research. The findings were very interesting. Um, in the course of the study, there was a teacher strike, and she told her fellow teachers we should honour the strike and not do any of the school work required, but we must fill in the questionnaires for the study because we teachers need that information. And she was as good as her word. During the strike, the study continued. Um, it, the findings were, of course, of policy interest, and it, it was amusing that both the main political parties, then the Tories and the Labour Party, quoted the findings in their manifesto, but of course they quoted different bits. They chose the bits that supported their policies and ignored the bits that didn't. Um, well, um, I, it's, it seems like this collaborations with the Department of Education, and yes. for which I understand that the knighthood cited your contributions yes. to education as much as to health. Yes. And um, so, um, tell us also, uh, a, a much later, the, uh, another study that you've been involved in that I think the American audiences would be very interested to know. This is the, during the Ceausescu era and, right. the, and the Romanian orphans coming to the United Kingdom and your involvement in, in, in studying the outcomes. Yes. <coughs> That's been one of the most interesting studies that I've uh, been concerned with. It started because the Department of Health, in this case, not education, approached me and said that we're aware that there are quite a lot of children being adopted from Romanian institutions into UK families. We have no idea what's going to happen to them. Can you do a follow-up, uh, find out what happened to them, and provide advice? They funded a pilot study which determined whether we could uh, trace them, whether we could get their cooperation, and we showed that we could. Uh, and so they then funded a larger scale study. And uh, that study is still going on. I no longer direct it. Um, it's Edmund Sanuka Bark in Southampton. Uh, but I remain involved as chairing the advisory committee on it. Why was it so interesting? Well, um, because we learned so many things we didn't know. Um, 
psychiatrists and psychologists sometimes want to prove that their views were correct. I have always thought that is the silliest idea I've ever heard about. Uh, of course, you want some of the things to be proved correct, but if I was right in all that I said at the beginning, it meant the whole of my career has been a waste of time. Um, so what did we learn? Well, we learned firstly um, that there was a substantial recovery in uh, most cases and that it also went on over quite a long time. So we're talking about years, not weeks or months. And uh, that was not thought to be the case, that either you got over it quickly uh, or you didn't at all. Then we found that um, the expectation, ours as well as everybody else's, was that the main problem would be the common emotional and uh, behavioural problems found in the general population. But in practice that's not what we found. We found that those were not increased unless they were associated with uh, what we call later deprivation-specific problems such as quasi-autism, um, uh, inattention over activity, disinhibited attachment and so on. Um, then we found that those where the institutional care had not got on beyond the child's age of six months, there were, at a group level at least, no discernible deficits. So that was interesting. Um, but then during the period leading up to the end of that first year, they zoomed up and deficits were found in a substantial minority, I mean up to about half. Um, and <coughs> the implication was that something had happened in the biology during that period. Why do I say the biology? Well, because the head circumference findings, and we knew from our own studies as well as others, that that is largely driven by brain size, um, that this, in those who are subnourished, was uh, the head circumference is down right from infancy onwards. Those with pure psychosocial deprivation, that's to say, that as, at least as indexed by body weight, um, they were not subnourished. Um, there, there was very little deficit in the first months, but it's the it was great up to two and a half, three standard deviations uh, thereafter. So something is happening there. And the follow-up also showed that the head size, although remaining below norm, increased up to the age of 15. Um, we don't know the findings as yet of the later follow-up in the 20s. Um, and that sort of raises question, what's going on? In what's making it happen? Um, and I guess out of the 20 odd surprising findings, let me mention just one more, which is that um, the average level of functioning actually was not a useful measure because there were children who had done very well in some respects and are showing appalling problems in others. Uh, it's easiest to illustrate that by an example. So there was one young woman uh, who, I don't remember exactly what her IQ was, but somewhere around about 65, so depressed. Um, and at follow-up, uh, it was still down at the same sort of level. Uh, and she had various um, behavioural problems. But she'd reached grade 8 in music. That's the highest grade you can reach in music. She was a singer. Um, and moreover, uh, she... Because um, I saw two films of performances she'd given. She held the audience in her hand. 
she'd got stage presence, and the disinhibited attachment, which had been a problem when she was younger, was now an asset. Uh, she did not have stage fright. Mm -hmm. um, and That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> here, and there would be several other examples, where people had used their deficits, as it were, as a strength. So, Well, you talk about this issue of the dynamic aspect of resilience, yes. right? You, I've seen that. It's very creative. Yes. And uh, so there, uh, tell us a little bit about resilience and the, you know, and also I, I understand you had some connection also with Norman Garmersey yes. in, in this respect. And so give, give us some ideas. Okay. Yes, I, Norm, I first met at a meeting in Bled back in the 70s. But then we jointly planned a seminar at the Stanford think tank on the hill uh, on stress coping and development. Um, and that was very much a formative experience um, in thinking about all the aspects of all of that, including resilience. Um, and you were at Stanford as a guest of the institute, uh, and at, at the time, at, the, at well, at the um, the center on the, the center, hill. yeah, which now is Norman now Norman part of Stanford. Norman was in Minnesota, right? Or Sorry, is, was he at Minnesota? No. Yes. Norman, I say that. Yeah. Oh, he was. At I want to put yeah. it on the tape because Dr. Klein is here, and oh right, so we got to bring in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then Norm subsequently, b before the, the centre experience, had spent a year in my department and we got to know each other yeah. uh, and, of course, his wife Edie very well. Um, and he was a very stimulating guy. I mean, he, he was great to work with and um, very responsive to ideas. Um, so, please, I interrupted you from, uh, while you were talking about the... the the research or the, the conceptualization of your ideas at the Stanford, the, the think tank? Yes, I thought of myself beforehand as a, um, as a very focused thinker. But I realized in comparison with my colleagues there, I was, I was a very lateral thinker in that I liked to bring in ideas from outside, as did Norm. Um, but many of the others of the centre didn't do that. So it changed the way I thought about things, certainly, and I think it changed the way Norm thought about things. The other people at the centre at the same time, uh, I would have thought less so, but they should speak for themselves on that. But we all became great friends. I mean, we all got on well together, and um, it was a, a great experience being part of a very interdisciplinary group all very bright, um, where there was no competition. Right. We were all going back to our usual jobs at the end of that time. So, as it were, my success made no difference to yours, your success made no difference to mine. Um, and that's a very special thing. I missed that when I got back, I have to say, back into the usual competitiveness uh, within universities, which is even you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, I guess I would really be remiss if I don't talk a little bit, ask you a question about autism, because uh, okay. you, your contributions to the field has been immense um, in the conceptualization of autism, yes. the the three dimensional conceptualization. Yes. Um, tell us how those conceptualizations evolved in your view um, subsequent to where the field was I mean uh, with childhood psychosis because I saw actually I have a copy of this 1960s book by Leo Kanner on childhood psychosis where autism is incorporated back into childhood psychosis yes. in the 60s um, but starting off as a unique yes. uh, phenomenological entity in the 40s and, uh, and Asperger's work and so on. So tell us a little bit about where, you, where I know you're going to give a lecture tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, to avoid getting diverted into an hour-long lecture, or at least a 45-minute <laughs> long lecture. Well, 
The follow-up study is what first got me interested. I mean, the first study was done in my thinking as a pot boiler while I got on with the serious matter of family studies. But the findings were so interesting uh, that I got hooked, uh, both in terms of the clinical phenomena but in terms of the scientific uh, issues. And uh, the comparison between the what we called infantile psychosis as well, because that's the terminology I used then along with everybody else, but was actually autism. Um, And the groups we compared with, uh, it's those three groupings that stood out and ultimately uh, led to the development of instruments for measuring these and it it sort of became concretized into those three domains. But the conceptualization uh, moved from being a psychogenic early variety of schizophrenia, which is never my view, but had been the view in the field. It was not Connor's view either, I may say, um, to a neurodevelopmental disorder came about particularly because of the finding that about one in five of the children without any detectable neurological abnormalities when young by the measures available at the time, um, developed epilepsy. And they developed epilepsy um, at an unusual time, which is late adolescence, early adult life. And that made it very interesting. We still don't know why that is so distinctive, but it is. Um, It can develop at other ages, but it is unusual in that being the peak period. And that certainly made me think very much neurodevelopmentally. Um, We also looked at cognitive patterns and uh, it became clear that those were playing a major role. So like Leon's own studies, um, finding that language development was a good prognostic factor, uh, intellectual delay was not. we found. I mean, Leon's findings and ours were very similar. Um, And, of course, alongside that, there is the work of Beata Hermelin and Neil O'Connor in England, and their experimental studies also showed the importance of cognitive deficits. So cognitive deficits is part, a key part, of the liability to autism became established. more by their work than mine, I would have to say, but we both came up with similar conclusions. Um, and they, that's no longer controversial. Now, has it provided an answer as to what is the basic deficit? Well, no, and I'll say more about that tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> One question that uh, in the most recent CDC uh, MMWR uh, report uh, suggests that the increased rate is among sort of less cognitively impaired, the yes. still, uh, more less severe forms of autism spectrum, yes. but also that it's more commonly seen among whites, less common among Hispanics and blacks, for example. So there are these demographic variations that are very interesting in those rates that the CDC is reporting, uh, that is picked up by the media. Um, so uh, we're seeing a lot of that um, uh, in terms of the publicity that autism research is getting. Well, what, do you, what do you think about what's going on in this new, new era of uh, autism where... Well, I don't know. Yeah. There certainly are epidemiologists such as Eric Fonbon who have said that they think this is entirely a result of a broadening of the concept together with better ascertainment. And that is certainly part of what has happened. But I remain sceptical that that provides all the answer. I think there has been an increase, probably. If there has been an increase, then one's got to be looking at prenatal and early postnatal risk factors. And that, I think, is one of the research needs now. What that will show, I don't know. Um, But it is clear that autism, although definitely a 
strongly genetically influenced disorder, uh, if you like a strongly biological disorder, uh, does involve environmental risk factors. The difficulty has been that we aren't quite sure what those are. May I ask a question? Uh, do you think also the diagnosis in areas where the, many of the minorities, whether they are black Americans or Latinos, are not as accurate as the other regions where <coughs> predominantly white populations are being studied? Do you think the geographic location of those studies might have something to do with it? Maybe. I haven't seen the CDC report, so... Yeah, um, neither have I, but I was um, just going, questioning whether you had... Yeah, it's an interesting report. Well, yeah, this is a... Uh, I mean, it is an amazing uh, honor to speak to you and to try to capture some of the vast topography of yeah. areas that you touched, but I think you really changed uh, the world uh, for children. And I want to thank you before we end. And I also wanted to get this quotation that got my eye because it's from um, Henry Maudsley's comment um, that if a man begins with certainties, he ends up in doubt. But if, if he is content to begin with doubt, he may end in certainties. I would say you're so humble. I think you would say <laughs> some certainties as, yes. we, as we move along. But the tenor of that idea. The tenor of that idea is there. Thank nice. you very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Well, that was. That's wonderful. Thank that you very was much. That was wonderful. wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad we captured it. Uh, to, for me, yes. it was a dream. Are you wanting to ask more questions now? Are you wanting to ask more questions? Yeah. No, you uh, want <laughs> maybe you could sure. just ask a few questions. Yeah, please. Um, well, I know Norm Garmazy, and, uh, and I worked with him uh, until his retirement and now he's passed. Um, and his long term study of, of resilience in children yes. that is continuing on with Alan Sroof in the uh, Center for Child Development at uh, the University of Minnesota. And we're, we're glad to have a connection. Uh, uh, with you on that, and I think led to an honorary professorship that you received from the University of Minnesota. Yes, uh, at some time, which I'm very proud of. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, we also had you back on the occasion of the hundredth anniversary of the University of Minnesota Medical School, a part I had some to do with, to give a, a special lecture uh, uh, honoring. Well, remembering that the medical school was 100 years old. That was in 1988. Um, so we have a connection with you from Minnesota. <clears throat> um, I might add that recently the Somali community, which is very large in Minnesota, has found, been found to have a higher rate of autism in, in their children and development. That, that is puzzling us all uh, as to what that's about. Um, and I mean, it's just a kind of um, an early finding. So we'll have to th think about that. Uh, I'm not sure if you have comments, either of you might have comments about that. Uh, uh, but it, it is, it has Very appeared. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I think when you, one gets things you don't understand like that, you've got to follow them through. Mm -hmm. I mean, that may of course just be chance yes. but on the other hand it may be telling us something about experiences that are putting them at risk yes. what are those experiences if they exist i had no idea but we need to find out yes uh, and one other point now about timing and uh, developmental phases. Uh, some of our faculty are studying uh, the, the um, uh, alcohol syndrome in children from mothers who are overusing. <clears throat> and in some studies of, of, of animal models, if a, the animal mother is given a dose of either alcohol or certain other drugs at a particular day, in the pregnancy, uh, neither before nor after that day, there will be an alcoholic, fetal alcohol kind of syndrome emerge in the offsprings of, of these, of these uh, animals. And, and we're kind of looking at what the comparable time of that is in, uh, in a mother's uh, use of alcohol during a pregnancy period. 
which also is, is quite an exciting um, uh, piece of information. Uh. Yes, I mean, my reading of the animal models literature is that it is not quite as confined as that, um, so that there are indications that you get some risk from um, uh, consumption later in the pregnancy, not as high as earlier on, um, but there are still questions as to does the risk for the fetal alcohol syndrome come from occasional high doses or from overall consumption? And we don't actually know that. Uh, animal models can help with that. What is of interest, I think, is that uh, it's clear that the peak period is in the first trimester. Um, but if you look at smoking, uh, which is also, of course, a risk factor, it's in the last oh, trimester. Yeah, at the end. Yeah. So the mechanisms have to be different, one thinks. So I think thinking developmentally is actually a very important part of what we all have to do. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, that's the challenge, of course, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to our work, indeed. Um, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I think I asked questions that I, that I wanted to, except there will be more, I think, that I'll, I'll have when it comes later. Uh, as Robert Frost says in his poem, uh, Mending Wall, um, my neighbor, he always thinks of the right thing to say, but it comes a few days later when I <laughs> wish I would have said it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, enjoy talking with you both very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Me, it has been, first of all, I learned a lot from your discussion. I thought that it was a wonderful series of questions. I thought Thank it was wonderful. Yes, I wish we would have had four hours. You and for me, me. <laughs> um, for me, it was a, a trip back to the years when <laughs> all those names were so familiar and yes. we talk about them every single day. So yes. it was, a, in a way, a, a happy trip to periods when all these activities and all right, these right. people so loved and respected were part of our group. It was wonderful. Well, thank and you. so thank were you. you with the questions that you asked. It was just a wonderful. I hope well, we can have a coffee. It's such an honor session. to uh, ask these questions and to have them on. I'm so glad that we were able to get your permission to, yeah. to do that. But there were a couple of times when I felt like laughing. I cannot. I hope you are not recording, are you? Yeah, then I'll save them for later. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Rudd. Okay, thank you. So we must have exhausted you, um, but it's not. It's still not three o'clock. So that's that's good. You've done very well. We can serve tea. Be British. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>